Ooh, that looks good. Some roller baron steaks. Can't wait till it's ready. So the idea behind cooking the bearings like that is to try to expand them a little bit with the heat and to make it a little bit easier to get them on. So I couldn't really do that with the other bearing for the pinion. One, the small one didn't need it because it wasn't interference fit. And two, I was afraid just the in and outs and having to maybe take it on and off and everything, it might not have been worth it to heat it up. I guess in hindsight, it didn't matter if you uh, watched my last video, but we're gonna go ahead now. We got these things, they're smoking a little bit. So we'll go ahead and try and see if I can't get them on. All right, well, that went on <laughs> heck of a lot easier than I thought it would, and that's, that's cool. So now that'll hopefully cool off and tighten up a little bit, I guess. Didn't expect that to go on quite that easy. All right, so this one's a little, being a little tougher. So we'll get a piece of wood here, a little crooked. All right, again, you want to make sure that these are uh, flush up against, and you can... You're not going to be able to see it. I'm not going to be able to zoom in, but you can see that uh, that they are flush up again. So we're going to go ahead, just kind of set that there like that. So I'm not putting weight on the bearing itself. If I can get it right. Yeah, I'll leave it like that. All right. So we'll let that just cool off a little bit and then we'll uh, move on to the next step. So the next big thing I need to do is measure backlash and then get this, the carrier all set up with the pinion. But obviously I got to put the gears on the inside. Now the workshop manual is pretty non-specific on this. If you remember when I took this all apart, I had shims everywhere and I kept them all together. And all I'm going to do is essentially put it back together now. These shims are all the same thickness, so I don't think it really matters left, right, top, bottom. And, and all the workshop manual says is to shim it as necessary to, let's see, reduce the end float to give minimum backlash consistent with freedom of rotation. So not a really, you know, not a qualitative or not a quantitative measurement, just a qualitative one. So we'll go ahead, put it back together and then check and see what I have for backlash. And I'm just going to go by feel. Didn't feel bad when I took it apart. I'm not going to make a big deal out of it. I'm just going to put it back together. So we'll put that, try to remember how I took it apart, put that bottom one in first because that one's the last to come out. Right, that goes in. Then we'll put the top one in. That'll probably want to fall down. Probably won't stay in there, nope. All right, then we'll get the side ones and I'm gonna put the side ones in and then turn the whole assembly as I go here and see if I can make this work. All right, get that in there so it kind of stays. Spin it around here and get this one. All right, so now the trick will be is getting these two gears lined up perfectly so that I can put the pin through. So that might be a little trickier than I had originally thought. So we'll, uh, we'll see if I can't get these things lined up here. Hold on. All right, so they're opposed from each other. I'm going to get the shims out. This might be one of those where you need 12 hands. Put the shim on. Hold that together this shim on. Hopefully now we'll be able to spin. All right, that feels pretty good. Probably have to play with it a little bit. Now the pin's going to go through the center and this is where my the locking pin goes. So obviously got a big hole here. So you want to go in from this way, get it lined up around my shim and into that gear. That's something to adjust that shim. All right, get that guy in there. Try to turn this now and get this, the hole here lined up vertically. Obviously that's a little trick there. Do it now while it's easy. All right, make sure to get that shim aligned. All right, and that's in there. So now that's in there. I'm not gonna put the pin in quite yet. Yeah, there, well, there's there's definitely backlash in there. You could probably see that moving. So really what you're doing here right, is you're pinching these gears together. So there's a lot more backlash 
if I hold the small gears and try to move the big gears, I get quite a bit of backlash. If I hold the big gears and try to move the small gears, I don't get any backlash. Ease of motion looks pretty good. The gears seem to be aligning properly. Like I said, I, I don't see any abnormal wear on the gears. They look like they're evenly worn. I don't, I don't think I'm going to play with it. I don't have any shims, and I don't believe, I didn't verify, but I don't believe these shims are available. So I'll look at that. Uh, this thing's not going to go back together yet, so I'll look at that. That's back together now. i got to put the pin in. I'll drive the pin in, and I'll come back and show you what's next. Got a dial gauge set up. Got the ring gear off because it'll just get in the way, and I'm going to measure here the total end float. So... What it tells you to do is push the whole assembly. You got to make sure that you move the races when you move this thing and the bearings, because if the races, if the bearings aren't centered in the races, you're going to kind of, um, it's going to fall a little bit. It's going to mess your, mess your uh, measurements up. So you want to push it until you get the whole assembly there all the way to what's going to be your left. So I've got that pushed. I got that zeroed out and what it says. Now I'll come around to the other side. And I'm going to push on the bearing in the race over here, and I'm going to go towards into the uh, dial indicator. All right, so about 83 thousandths or so. There's rate, there's shims that go in here on both sides of the bearings, a little bit on each side, and I saved them from what it had. But now that's giving me my total end float, so I know the total shim pack thickness has got to be about 83 thousandths of an inch or so, a little bit more than that. This uh, the, you need a case spreader here, which I haven't built yet but we'll, uh, we'll see if I actually need it or not. So now that that's done and I've got that set up, now I know my total end float tells you to remove the dial gauge and take the, uh, the housing back off. So now that I know my total end float, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the ring gear and put that guy on. I'm gonna set the dial gauge up on the opposite side, but do the same type of measurement. Now what that's gonna tell me is it's gonna tell me the, the mesh engagement with the pinion, and it's also going to be, I would expect it to be a smaller measurement because now that mesh gear and the pinion are gonna to mesh together and I'm not gonna get as much. So that'll be the next setup. So when I get that set up and uh, get that ready to go, I gotta put the ring gear on, I'll show you. So a very similar setup here as I had before, except now I got the ring gear on. I kind of spun it a little bit just to make sure I had a good mesh engagement with the pinion and I do. I don't think you really can have anything but. So now what we'll do is we're gonna push, push this whole assembly so that it's away from the ring gear as much as possible. All right, and then zero it up. All right, it's about as close as I think I'm gonna get it. And then we'll push it towards it. And I'm getting about 36 thousandths or so, 35 and a half thousandths. So we'll write that number down and that number is referred to as the B dimension. The other one was the A dimension. We're gonna do some math here and we're gonna figure out what we need for the total shim pack. These calculations are right out of the workshop manual, it gives an example of how to do it, so I'll show you. So I got a total float of that 83 and a half thousandths, and then it gives you a preload of three thousandths. You add those two together, 0.0865 or 86 and a half thousandths, that's my total shim pack thickness that I need. Measuring all the shims that I have, I've got about 90 thousandths. Yep, about 90 thousandths worth of shim packs. So I should be be able to get there. So at least this one is uh, coming in a little bit better than my, my pinion height did, that it's getting me pretty close. So anyway, so I need a total shim pack of 86 and a half thousandths. Then there are two sides here. You've got an X side and a Y side. The Y side is specified as that nearest to the ring gear. So that's the first one it calculates. That in out, the in out when I was meshing the gears, that difference I got was that 35 and a half thousandths. And then it wants a backlash of five thousandths. So you subtract those two and you get 30 and a half thousand. So that's the shim pack that I need in the ring gear side. And then you go to the other side and all you do is subtract the difference there so you can figure out on how many shims to do on the other side. So I got my total shim pack of 86 and a half thousandths. Measure the minus out the shim pack that I put on the Y side or the ring gear side. And that, uh, that's that 30 and a half thousandths. And then the total shim pack that I need to put opposite of that is to give me that and the calculation there is 56,000. So I've got six shims here of varying sizes. That's all these guys over here. So what I wanna do is try to get as close to these two magic numbers with the shims that I have 
and see how close I can get. So I'll come back here when I do this uh, mental gym here to see what I can come up with. So the object here is to make a case spreader as close to what I can find in the workshop manual. So essentially I've got a big old piece of quarter inch plate here that I got at a scrap yard for like literally $3. I'm gonna go ahead, try to make a plate on either side here that's gonna fit down and bolt to the case. And then we'll have a threaded rod in between. And essentially what that threaded rod will do is those two pieces are gonna be separated from each other, but then attached with that threaded rod just like the workshop manual shows it. And then I'll have two, notes, two nuts on that threaded rod and run those nuts out and hopefully just slowly pull that case apart. So the first thing I gotta do is get the contour here. Now I'm gonna be pushing from this side because this is where the bearings go. So I wanna get the contour here, right? So now I got that. So I'm gonna transfer that to the quarter inch plate here and give me enough overhang on either side to be able to make it kind of work. So I don't have uh, real good tools for this heavy duty or stuff. So it's going to take a little while, make a lot of noise, a lot of, uh, a lot of metal shavings and all that kind of stuff. So we're going to go ahead, transfer that template down to this quarter inch plate and then start cutting that stuff out. Got the back half into the differential all painted up nice and pretty. You can see right here, this flat section on the very early Spitfires, they had a drain plug in there. And then for whatever reason, Triumph decided to delete that. And now it's just a, just a flat portion on this differential that I have in the Spitfire. Now I took this to a machine shop and I had them drill that out and pipe it or tap it with uh, pipe threads and I have a drain plug in it. Not gonna do that to this one. What I'm gonna essentially do is swap the, uh, the end caps because they're identical. And that one actually, the threads in here, the, um, I'll come around and show you. It's still a little wet, so I don't wanna touch it, but these threads here, these six bolt holes is where the leaf spring attaches, the transverse leaf spring. And these aren't as in good a shape as the other differential. So that's another reason why I'm gonna swap this out, but I decided to paint it in any way. Swap the cap caps out. That way it'll let, I'm gonna to wanna to look in the inside of that differential anyway. And I'm not gonna waste the money to, to put a drain cap in this one. I think what happened is Triumph decided that they didn't need to change out the differential oil. They just needed to top it off from time to time. So whatever, whatever led them to that conclusion, I'm not quite sure, but that's obviously a, a little weird but I don't think the, uh, the TR4 has a drain plug in it either. So we got this nice and painted up now and we'll continue on with uh, getting that case spreader done. Beautiful fall day out here, in case you can hear the wind blowing. Hopefully it's not uh, gonna be too painful, but you can see here I made another circle, this one on the outside. The, uh, I used the gasket this time instead of that contour gauge. You can see it's a much better half circle and everything. And I just, the new gasket just traced the inside diameter of it because that's where I want this to, to meet up, not the outside. So I'm just taking a, uh, a cutoff wheel here and slowly working my way around. And it's not a straight cut because the cutoff wheel gets too big. So it kind of bevels down like this, I expect it to. So I'm just gonna have to go around when I'm done and, and square it up with the uh, angle grinder. And I got a Sawzall too, just to try to, if I can cheat a little bit, but otherwise it's just a kind of a long and lengthy process to cut the half moon out. And uh, we're just gonna go, go at it. And, See how it comes out. You can see there the the uh, the angle that that cut on. So now we'll go ahead and start shaving that down. Things hot. Go ahead and start shaving that down and, and uh, form fit it to the differential housing with the angle grinder to get that flush. All right. So as you can see, these ears here need to get widened out as I kind of expected because of the, because of the angle. So I'm just going to go ahead and slowly flatten those up and check it and flatten and check it and flatten and check it until I can get it as close to that seam as possible because I need to drill those three bolt holes in that so that that attaches. So we'll continue on down that path and then we'll have to figure out some way that we can actually get this to spread. So when I get this thing fitted up and get it uh, nice and purdy and then get the other one done, I'll come back and show you what it looks like. All right, so there you go, hopefully. Anyway, the, uh, the next step now is gonna be able to make some way, one, first I gotta attach, so I'll take care of that. And two, then I've gotta be able to spread them apart. So. I'm not quite sure how I'm gonna do this yet. I'm thinking that this, these two ears there need to be cut back quite a ways, even, even um, 
way out here, even with that bolt hole so that I get some space in there. But I'm not quite sure, uh, I'm not quite sure how I'm gonna do that yet. So uh, who knows? I, I tried to get the bearings in. I can't remember if I recorded that and showed it to you or not. If I did, you saw me, but I tried to get the uh, shims in, I mean, and uh, I can get all of them in on one side and all but one in on the other side. So this thing does not need to be spread too much. So hopefully my, uh, I'm gonna have to do some welding and, and some other uh, interesting things here. So hopefully my, my skills don't, uh, don't hold it up, but we'll see. Right, I'm pretty confident that this is not going to work. The, uh, what I failed to take into account is I should have made these wings come out further and that way I could push on the center of the metal here instead of welding these tabs in like you saw me do. And I think it's just gonna, these are gonna come apart or something that's just not gonna be enough, enough uh, oomph to keep them straight. So I am gonna try it. I'll get the shims ready to go here and, and see if I can get you know just barely close enough but I think, uh, I think I see a redesign in my future, unfortunately. All right, gonna be kind of hard to film here, I think, but I got my, uh, got my shims ready to go on the particular sides that they go on. So we'll see how much, just gonna kind of tighten these down. Now it also makes a big deal out about not, uh, not going too crazy with this and not spreading it too far so you don't mess something up, obviously, and bend it. Uh, I think the TR4 workshop manual I get, actually gives you a spec on how far you can bend it, but the Spitfire one doesn't. All right, so these both of these lag screws are going like this as I kind of thought they would. So we'll see here. I got enough to be lucky. Yeah, I think I got it. Yeah, holy cow. It actually worked. All right, we'll take the tension off. All right, tension's off. I'm gonna pull this. Actually, I'm gonna put the bearing caps on first. Now these are these have little letters on them. You can see there, I think. I don't know if you can see that, but there's an X in there. And there's an X on, not that side, but this side. So they're kind enough to line them up for you. And this one's got a U on it and a U on that side. Make sure I don't have the, make sure I don't have the shims pinched in there or anything. They feel good. All right, tighten these caps down. All right, so there you go, that's in there. Now there is a spec for backlash. If you can feel that, I don't know what the spec is, but that's what's going on there, that's the backlash. So we'll see, I don't know. And let's see if it actually turns. It does, actually not too bad. Doesn't sound good though, I tell you that. All right, we got some backlash there. As expected, there is some spec for it. I don't know what it is off the top of my head. Something that I can check. And we also got a little bit of noise here when we rotate it. I'm pretty sure that's not, uh, that's not a good sign. So we'll have to look into that and see what that's coming from. So, I mean, obviously it's the gears, but I don't know if, uh, if you know if you've got that knock. Who knows, maybe, maybe the backlash is too much, tooth engagement, right? So all that stuff now is leading up to this for these checks. So we'll get some Prussian blue on here. We'll look at our engagement. We'll measure our backlash and continue on with the rebuild. Next up on the agenda is to measure the backlash of the ring gear. And uh, this is about a zero, zero as I can get it, five ten thousandths. So the spec here is four to six thousandths. And all you do, it tells you to just rock the thing back and forth. So I'm starting at uh, five ten thousandths, 
move it forward and I got about 22 thousandths or so. So the delta there is about two thousandths, two and a half thousandths, somewhat like that. So obviously I need to change that up a little bit. So what it tells you is you've got a certain number of shims on this side, certain number of shims on this side, like I showed you in doing that math. And what I want to happen is now you've got your total shim pack thickness correct, but now you have to switch sides around to make sure that you can set this ring gear either to the left or to the right to engage the pinion more or less. So I'm assuming that since my backlash is a little tight here, I want to engage the pinion less to give it a little bit more wiggle room. So I'm going to want to move my ring gear this way because the pinion's over here. So I want to move the ring gear towards, towards the outside of its direction of travel there. So I want to remove a shim here and then put it on the other side. Now I have no concept that, that Workshop Manual doesn't get into, you know, a thickness will equal this much play or anything like that. So I'll put the spreader back on, take these things back off and take the thinnest shim out of this side, put it on the other side and measure it up again. Just, uh, and again, like, like everything else has been with this, it's just a bunch of trial and error. So I'll get to put my, uh, who knows how long it'll last case spreader back into practice here and we'll uh, swap shims and I'll come back and see what's going on with the backlash. All right, before I get too much ahead of myself, I got the carrier out here. Obviously the, uh, the spreader continues to work for now. The workshop manual specifically calls out these bolts here and getting new lock washers underneath of them. So I got a set of uh, lock washers for those, torque these, torque these down. The spec for the bearing bolts, that the carrier bearings that go over here, and these bolts are about the same. One's 35 to 40 and the other one is 38. I don't remember which is which. I didn't, I didn't bring the book with me. So I'm just gonna torque them all to 38 foot pounds. So these got torqued to 38 foot pounds. And now I'm ready to uh, check my shim heights here and go back in. So I'm gonna measure my, my shim thicknesses here and they're both pretty thick, unfortunately. So I got one that's about uh, 185 thousandths or so. And the other one is 11 thousandths or so. So I'm afraid if I take one out, it's 11 thousandths, that's gonna be way too much. So let me play around here a little bit. Let me come to some happy medium and see if I can't get uh, some thin ones out of here and see what I can do. All right, so I played around the shims a little bit and uh, it looks like I got it. It's just about five thousandths or so. So I'm gonna continue to rotate this guy around, check it a couple more times. I have the, uh, the spread around here, but it's not under tension at all. So this should be pretty accurate. So like I said, you wanna take it at a couple different spots. So I'll, I'll take it at least the cardinal directions and probably a couple more just to spot check it. And then, uh, but that should be it. It's just, like I said, mixing and matching the, the shims to, to get about what you want for the backlash. So nothing more than painful, you know, reiterations. All right, it's in there, everything's torqued. Obviously the, the, uh, the spreader's off. You can hear that, that it surprised me that six thousandths is that much play, but that's, that's what it is. So it's not incredibly consistent all the way across, but it is within the spec all the way across. And, and I have a feeling, you know, if this thing heats up a little bit, the spec's going to be different than if it cools down a little bit and all that kind of stuff. So I, I think, I think it's close enough, but now, uh, now the stuff that can undo everything that I just did is to look at gear mesh. So I've got some Permatex Prussian blue, this stuff here. And I'm going to put it on the, uh, clean up the gears a little bit cause I got oil on there. I don't know how this stuff reacts with oil and uh, then rotate that thing around and see what kind of gear tooth engagement I get and bounce it off the workshop manual and see if I'm gonna get lucky or if I'm gonna be doing all, doing all that work all over again. Got the gear here. We're gonna go ahead and try this Prussian blue stuff. Put it on with a paintbrush, I guess. All right, well, I can see it, but the gear being black definitely uh, definitely makes it a little tricky. But anyway, we'll run this thing around and we'll see what happens here. Brush these again and I'll, uh, I'll see if I can get you a close up. It's gonna be a little tricky to see, I think. All right, I can definitely see engagement here and it looks to me though that it's heel contact. All right, so this is a little interesting. You can see here on the edges, I think, here, 
You hear that little shiny spot? It's like a, um, it's almost like a shark's fin look to it. That is the contact point when I rotate it in one direction. When I rotate it in the other direction and come look at the other side, you can see the contact point way at the back here, way at the back. So I don't know what's going on because you look at the workshop manual and it shows you kind of even contact points. So I don't know. I have no idea what the heck that means. So I obviously need to do a little bit of research and figure out why the, uh, the contact points aren't nice and even. Like, uh, like at least I think they should be. I turn the thing with a drill. doesn't make any weird noises or anything. But then again, you know, you're only turning at 2100 BM, whatever the drill is. So who knows? But uh, yeah, a little bit of research there. So here's a close up of what I hope anyway is essentially the crown wheel or the ring gear. So I've got the two sides, the concave side and the convex side, the heel and the toe. And one's the driving side and one's the driven side or the coast side, I should say. So the pattern that I'm seeing right now kind of looks like this with the contact point is here. And here. So in my research, what, what that's telling me is that the pinion gear is too low. So as you move the pinion gear out or up into the mesh, right, the height of the ring gear doesn't change, the height of the pinion does, what will happen is this pattern will tend to shift this way and in like this. And they'll just essentially, they kind of make a lazy S. So it would come up like this and it would come out into the center and then it would go like this. So if I went too far, my pattern would shift to here and here. So I'm going to take it back apart a little bit and I'm going to recheck the pinion depth and maybe, who, kn who knows, it doesn't make much sense to me, but maybe as it settled or whatever, I got too far in there, recheck that pinion depth and then have to pull that bearing off again and uh, maybe put more shims in there. But that what this is telling me is my pinion gear is too deep and that I'm too far off. So all the pretty pictures in the workshop manual essentially have it a lot better a lot better aligned than what I've got it with these patterns more towards the center and more concentrating top and bottom. So I had to go and, and do some research to try to figure this out. So take it back apart, check that pinion height real quick. I'll come back with the, uh, with the results of that and then we'll see. And I don't think I have any more shims. So we'll see if I have to order some more parts. Well, I retook the pinion height and I got 1.867, give or take, or excuse me, the pinion depth from where it is right now. And uh, when I did it, the last time I got 1.94. So that's, you know, that's almost a hundredth of an inch or 10 thousandths, which is, uh, which is a lot. I don't have a shim that that's thick. That is that thick, but that measurement jives with what I'm seeing on my mesh pattern. So either I, I made an error or made a mistake, or when it finally got torqued, it compressed a little bit or whatever. I'm not sure, but I'm going to have to take the pinion back out get that bearing off, which is a little sketchy because the last time I did it with the original one, it uh, didn't go well and I messed the bearing up. So I got to be ready to, to purchase another bearing, but, which you can get there, you know, 20 bucks or so. But anyway, so I'm going to go ahead, pull that bearing out or pull the uh, pinion out, try to get that bearing off without causing any damage and then look at, uh, look at getting some, some shims. So we'll uh, we have to go to go back into the parts and order some stuff up from a uh, roadster factory again, but at least, uh, at least my pattern is checking with what I'm getting for measurements now. So that makes me feel a little bit better. Got that bearing off without causing any damage. So that was good. Saved myself about 30 bucks there. Did notice some damage on the inner, inner diameter of the, of the thinner shims. Don't know if they went in crooked. It doesn't really tell you to sandwich the thicker shims on the outside of the thinner ones. I don't know if maybe I should have done that, but the, uh, I don't know if that could have impacted anything. But then I took my pinion height again and I got uh, about two thousands different than I got last time. So kind of frustrated a little bit there. I don't know what's going on with that. So, but, uh, but this is how you're, this is how you kind of do it. So you, you saw the interpretation of that, uh, the gear meshing and all that kind of stuff. So we'll get these shims on hand and kind of re, uh, re-engage when we get those. But for now, the video is running a little bit long, so I'm going to end it here and uh, we'll make this a three-part series on getting this puppy back together. So thanks for watching. Thanks for sticking with us. I know this isn't the most exciting stuff. And uh, I'd like to also say that I just went over 4,700 subscribers. So thanks everybody for the continued support. Keeps me motivated. 
and I uh, and I and I do appreciate all the the comments and the likes and the subscriptions. So have a good rest of your day. Thanks again for watching. Cheers.